All right. Sorry, Shoni just reminded me to uh, turn on the recording. So again, as I was saying, it was um, that you think you know a little bit about somebody and just reading a little bit more, you find out things that you didn't know about them. James has uh, 1,147 flights and 1,199 hours on pa paragliders. He's flown 48 paragliders at 83 sites raced in 213 competition tasks and attended several SIV and ACRO training clinics. He's won some tasks at the U.S. and Canadian meets and won the Canadian Open overall title in 2014. In the World Cup paragliding, his best task finish is 11th, 60 seconds behind um, Kriegel. Locally, he holds the distance record at Brace Mountain, an FAI triangle record for Brace and Ellenville. So without further ado, I'll t turn it over to you. Thank you, Leslie. So, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I want to be pretty interactive tonight to the extent that you guys are feeling it. So uh, let's... Uh, be be willing to jump in anytime and if it feels like it's too crowded to jump in let's use the raise hand button so if you aren't used to that please go to the bottom of your screen to the, your reactions button and when you click on that you'll see a raise hand button click on that now if you would and you'll see the hand show up so um this will let me see that you've got a question or something you'd like to say uh and uh, just leave it up and I'll call on you. And then when, um, or if your question gets answered or you've been called on, then uh, I'm going to let you lower hands yourself just so that um, no one else has to do that for you. Leslie's waving now. I don't even know how to do that, but any kind of raised hand will be fine. So jump in freely, raise your hand. Otherwise, please don't put things in the chat. I don't want to stop and have to read things out of the chat. Let's just have a conversation. All right. Um, Oh, and one thing that can be handy is uh, if you want to unmute yourself just temporarily to talk, just hold on the space bar. That's the Zoom feature. Hold the space bar while you're talking. You'll notice your Zoom, your uh, mute icon goes away and you can speak and then just release it to go back to being muted. Okay, so let's talk about spring conditions for a moment. We'll do this part quickly because I think everybody's pretty acquainted, but what are the challenges with spring conditions? Why do people worry about them? I'll give it a shot because um, the trees are still bare. So there's a lot of um, uh, rock exposed or other surfaces exposed to enable heating. And then there's also a big temperature differential because it's still cooler up high, I guess. Okay, so the the bare trees trees definitely uh, dampen uh, the harshness of thermals uh, when they're leafed out, and so that's definitely a factor, I think. And uh, leafy trees do store heat and will release thermals um, during the summer, but uh, leafless trees are definitely uh, a harsher deal. the The temperature differential and the temperature gradient uh, that doesn't necessarily make it rougher if you have a a good lapse rate in the atmosphere that could ju just make nice thermals and an unstable day but um uh, but if you m mix it with the the harsh beginnings then the flying relatively low yeah it can be pretty sporty um and then it might also be high because of the difference like uh, Tom was talking a minute ago about uh, having gotten to 8,500 feet at Ellenville after launching at five o'clock the other day. So, and actually the highest I've ever been was with Eduardo and Daniel, uh, April 1st of 2021. We launched at five o'clock, just hoping to fly down because the wind had finally backed off at Brace a little bit. We flew at 10,000 feet for the next hour and a half. It was crazy. Um, so spring can 
bring unstable good in, in a good way conditions and it can also bring strong conditions what's another factor uh james yeah oh yeah just go ahead tom yep okay yeah uh <clears throat> i had a, a good friend who said that uh flying was like you start the season with the world series and then you have your regular season play that uh you know you're unless you travel a lot you're rusty and then you go out in potentially nice strong conditions and uh you know as opposed to the mellow air that you finished up the season with i, I was just saying that on one of our on our elmville group that it's it's the irony of it is like the you know your muscle memory is used to you know if you didn't go anywhere your muscle memory is used to the fall and then it, it, as the conditions are the strongest you're you know, you're you're the rustiest tom and you're the strong and the conditions are the strongest it's like yeah it's like backwards yeah but i like the world series analogy that's funny yeah that's it that's a good one and um so i, I want to say a word about this rusty concept um uh while anyone who doesn't fly for a few months isn't current and is and you're you're definitely going to lose a step i i really don't like to think of myself as rusty because i think if i hold the idea that i'm rusty i'm going to act rusty and uh when i get ready to pull up the glider i can choose to be on my game whether i flew yesterday or six months ago and so i think it's important to have that choice explicitly in mind like i'm uh, get your mental place to where it needs to be you might have to take a moment to remember how to do that but don't go to launch and hold your a lines thinking geez i'm really rusty because you won't be able to move one foot from the other and you'll be in the bushes um so people use the word rusty a lot i wouldn't I encourage you not to use the word rusty about yourself but at the same time, yeah, if it's been a while. Um, and if you have less experience, then months off makes more of a difference, I think. So if you're a relatively new pilot, then it, I think becomes more important to go do some kiting and get get familiar with pulling the glider up and be, and be willing to, to fly in mild conditions at first. And if you have new equipment, I have a personal story about this. So I have a new glider this this spring and a new harness. And um, and I cavalierly went to launch a brace a couple of weeks ago. And it was kind of gusty. And uh, Joe was the only other person there. And he launched OK. Um, but it was clearly a bit sporty just watching his wing move around. And I pulled the glider up first time I've ever pulled this glider up. So very cocky attitude, right? And I've gotten away with it before. I've taken a new comp wing to Brazil and still in the bag because it had, hadn't been nice conditions around here to kite it. And I've gotten away with it, but you kind of have to look at that as something that I got away with rather than something that's a good idea. And in this case, the the new wing has more aggressive launch characteristics than the one I've been flying. So I and I happened to pull up and there must have been a gust a little off the ground. So I got plucked. I got fully plucked and dropped on my back and um, no no damage. But um, and I pulled it up one more time and uh, not very well controlled. And I find myself lying on the ground facing forward, still flying the wing, wondering if the wind would just pick me up a little because then I could fly away. But it never did, so I ended up putting it down, and and the the conditions continued to be gusty. So I ended up folding up the wing and having to hike all the way back down the Seven Falls Summits Trail with my fifty five pound bag. So that's me taking an arrogant approach that I really don't recommend. I'm telling you the story, so hopefully you guys won't do that. Um, What's the new wing? Did you go up a class or down a class or? It's the same class as what I've been flying. It's a Xeno 2. Oh. So, um, but it has more aggressive launch behavior than the Leopard I've flown the last couple of years. Okay. Um, it reminds me of my last couple of boomerangs, uh, just in terms of how hard it uh, surges or shoots when, it, when I pull it up. So 
um, be willing to to hike down, be willing to, um, I think it was good that I was willing to hike down. I was frustrated, I was annoyed, but um, uh, that might be the right thing. And better start out by going to a field and doing some kiting, especially if you have some new gear. Um, get used to it and let your body remember how to do that. So anyone else have something to add about spring conditions before we get into cross country? I think I, I met you at the top of uh, Brace that day. Uh, I hiked up with Joe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you, you were there briefly with no wing. That's right. Yeah. Um, um, there was another uh, pilot there. What was her name? Um, also with no wing, but a dog, maybe. Karen, uh, I think? Yeah, Karen. That's right. Okay. I'm going to share my iPad here, so give me a moment. Tonight's uh, discussion is going to not be organized, and that's intentional. Uh, my experience of discussions is if I feel like I know what's coming, then my brain starts to wander, and I think I need to go get a sandwich or something. And um, so... Feedback, I'll welcome feedback afterward uh, about how this worked, but um, this is what we're gonna do. So is everyone seeing a white iPad screen, a whiteboard? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see, I'm gonna switch something on my display here. I can figure out how to do it now. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to make a mark, and does everybody see a mark? Yes. Okay. All right, so we'll go over here, and we'll grab, that's not the one we want to start with. Hi, I guess we can start with that. So first, what is a cross-country flight? Any flight where you don't know where you're going to land. Yeah, I think that's right. Any flight where you where you go and land somewhere where there isn't a windsock, where um, uh, where your car isn't parked already, and and yeah, you you generally don't know which field that's going to be. And if you come back and land by your car, then you want someone somewhere else first. So. An out and return or a triangle is still a cross country flight. So, what's the most important thing in a cross country flight? Land safely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Landing safely. Nothing else matters much. There's, it doesn't matter if you go far. It doesn't matter if you got high. It doesn't matter if you had a low save or didn't have a low save. It matters if you land safely. And so one of the things that um, happens is as time goes by, if you, if you do a lot of cross-country flying, you'll have some landings that weren't really that safe, but you weren't injured, you, nothing terrible happened. So after I land, I like to ask myself, is that a landing I could do 10 times out of 10? Um, and if it is, then I'm calling that a safe landing. And as soon as my answer, my honest answer is nine, that wasn't a safe landing. That's one I got away with. And so one of the challenges in the sport is to separate what we got away with from what was actually safe to do, because the outcome might be the same, which is you're fine, you're in a field, you're packing up. But you might, if you can't do it 10 times out of 10, if you're not sure, then that wasn't really a, a safe landing and we all have those from time to time but it's not what we're going for and if it, if it ever gets down to eight or below then you might want to go and buy a lottery ticket um because if you have a hundred cross-country flights that means if all of them were like that 20 of them would have mishaps so it's really not not okay okay so landing safely is really important and, um, and 
And also you need to be always aware of what, what, the places you're flying over. Can I land there? Can I land there? Can I land there? Even That's in small correct. aircraft, they encourage you to always keep a field in sight in case the engine conks out. Yeah. <laughs> it, seems like, it seems like people end up flying as far as they can possibly go, and then they're forced to land someplace that's not safe. A lot, some people. Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about how to manage that while, while we're flying cross country. Um, but that's absolutely right. We need to have, have a field that we can land in and um, that we can get to if we don't find another thermal. You were talking about motorized planes. As, as, when I was first learning to paraglide, I read a thing somewhere that, that said, is it safe to fly without a motor? I think it was on the Will's Wing website. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I'll go read that. And the, the main point was it's arguably safer to fly without a motor because people who have motors believe that the motor is going to keep running. And so that leads you to fly low over 10 miles of trees and things like that, where, whereas if you didn't have a motor, you wouldn't do that because you'd know you weren't going to get there. So, um, Not to mention the sink rate in a lot of these small airplanes is not very good. Right. Yeah, if you do have to glide in your in your small airplane, that may not that that, that may not go well. Um, Touchdown okay. distance is long. It's yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> so, what skills do you need for cross country flying? An engine. <laughs> Judgment. Judgment of what? Oh, a lot of things. Wind direction. Wind direction, okay. Let's just put wind because wind speed also, and this is gonna come up all, all through everything. So yeah, that's a really good one. What else? Airspace. Airspace and how to potentially fly around it. What about evaluating landing fields? Definitely. So, you got to be able to look from the air and pick landing fields out. And you might have a bunch of fields available, but there are some things that you find out, like when you're at 5,000 feet, what looks like foot tall yeah. grass turns out to actually be bushes over your head. Um, don't yeah. ask me how, how I know that, but um, you want to, Think of think smartly about the vegetation that's down there. Uh, what looks like foot tall corn might turn out to be seven foot tall corn. So um, that's one thing. It's easy to get wrong from up high. Another one is um, how flat the field is and how level the field is. So if the field is sloping down, let's say it's sloping into the wind, and I come along flying into the wind, I might have a glide that just kind of matches the slope of the field. And that means I'm not gonna to touch the ground until whatever the obstacle is up ahead, the wire or the road or the building or something. So that means that my landing is gonna be challenging. I'm gonna to have to do a side hill landing or something else. So you wanna pay a lot of attention to how flat and how level the field is. What else? Power lines. Sprinkler heads, fences, livestock. <laughs> so if you have two fields next to each other and one has a has several cows and one has one cow, which one do you want to land in? The one that has no wires. Yeah, that's a good answer. Uh, there is an answer about the cows, though. You want to and land in the one with several cows because the other one's a bull. <laughs> <laughs> bull Sounds bulls right. get by, them, by themselves. <laughs> um, For bad behavior. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. I like that. So, 
Wires are a good are a good one. Wires can be really hard to see from up high. Um, they're not they're they're not too bad in this country. Um, but keep looking, and you're looking for the poles um, when you're in the air because. Uh, you're much more likely to see the poles and you, you'll see poles. And then later, as you get lower, you, maybe you'll fill in where the wires are. But um, you will you can frequently see the poles long before you can figure out where the wires are. And then in uh, Mexico, for instance, there'll be a big bare field with a little house or building in the middle. There's always one wire going out to that building and it's held up by two hockey sticks. It doesn't have poles in the way we think of them. You got to find that wire because uh, it's there, and you don't want to fly into it. So this is all very possible. It sounds alarming when you when you haven't done it. It's very possible you will be able to work this out. You will be able to to find safe places to land. But uh, but you really want to look for power lines a lot. And high tension lines, the high voltage ones are more visible and tend to gleam in the sunlight. And of course they have the huge towers that look like giants stealing the wires, but um, you really don't want to get close to those. Okay. Um, so evaluating landing fields is a, is, is a key skill. Um, what else might you want to be able to do? Find thermals. Thermaling. So you don't have to climb like Bianca to be able to fly cross country and have a good time flying cross country. So it's good to practice thermaling um, and practice around and any any time you're flying, of course, you want to practice this. Um, but don't put pressure on yourself to reach some particular level. You can have a great cross country flight without being a brilliant thermaler, particularly on a good day. If you're good at it, it will help you go farther. It will help you make the most out of a weekday and things like that. But it's not something to stress too much about. Just keep paying attention to it and, and you'll get better. So when we come back to landing safely, the biggest one of these is evaluating landing fields. And wind needs to be in there also. How, how can you tell what the wind's doing in a field? when you don't have a windsock down there. 360s. Okay, you can do 360s. And if you do a 360 at 1,000 feet, what might be different at 100 feet than what you saw at 1,000 feet? Wind direction and shear, yeah. Wind direction and wind strength. Yeah. And it could be different. The wind direction could be 180 degrees, uh, or it could be the same. And the wind could be weaker, or it could be stronger. Um, look around for visual clues. Flags are good, smoke is good. Uh, laundry on a line might be blowing. Um, laundry, Ripple. yeah. sorry? Ripples on, on water. Ripples on water is a great one. Um, so get a feeling for what the wind is gonna be. Um, so, when you first go cross country, you're going to be, be uh, really focused on uh, your first landing fields. And you want to be conservative because you haven't done this much. So pick a big field. And, um, and there's, a, there's one more skill that we might add here, which is just landing skill. I don't like spot landings because people trying to do spot landings often crash on the spot. And I think that's still a crash. Um, be willing to overfly the spot. But whenever you're landing at your home site, have a spot in mind, have a place you're, you're thinking to land. And if, you, if you're short or you overfly it by 50 yards because you got popped a little bit, don't worry about that. But just do have the intention to land at a particular place. And if you're consistently a quarter mile away from that, that's a clue that you might not be ready to fly cross country yet. Um, Cause you do want to be able to get it safely into a field without running into the trees at the far end. 
I would have one more skill. It's arguably part of thermaling, but deciding where to go next is a deciding skill. Where to go next, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, you're going to go where you think the thermal is going to be, but uh, that's something I struggle with. Are you talking about how to find the next thermal? Yeah, how to stay up. But, you know, you have 360 degrees of, uh, of options in all directions. So, uh, yeah, it's a lot of choice. That's James. my dog licking me, by the way, if you hear slurping. I have a question, James. Is, is there a map where all the information of where pilots have stopped to get lift, let's say leaving Ellenville, going towards, let's say Boston or whatever. Is there yes. some kind of yeah. map with yeah. things in it that says this is a kind of a house thermal, at least on a west day, or is there anything like that out there? There is, there's a there's a thermal map. Um, I'll send out the the link to it. I can't, I can't remember what it's called. Um, and what it what they've done is they've they've scraped all the data from X contest and Leonardo and uh, looked at where people have climbed and where people have climbed a lot. They uh, it shows as a bright spot or a red spot or something. And um, you can also look at uh, I think on Leonardo. Maybe it's on the same map. I'm not sure. I'll I'll, I'll find the uh, the track map. But there is there is a way to see all the tracks that have been posted at once. So you can see all the directions people have gone and all the flights that people have taken from a particular launch. Um, and uh, okay, Shani has posted in the chat the link to the. Uh, okay, so it has thermals and skyways. Skyways is just where everyone has gone. So the the thing about the thermal map is it's it's most effective at the places where people have flown a lot because um, otherwise there's just not enough data to to say you know, no one might have climbed twice at a particular peak, even though there might be a thermal there every day. And so you have to kind of keep that in mind. In the Alps, it's really it's really good and it just sort of shows you there's thermals all over the place in the mountains but um uh uh that that's the closest thing to what you're talking about i'm going to go grab another question here okay cone diagram so i know you guys have seen these before So one that, that often gets drawn, here's a landing field, and that's way too steep, of course, it's just for illustration, and paragliders, and the green lines represent the glide slope. So obviously our friend over here doesn't have glide to that landing field. Um, so when you're flying around, you try to stay within this slope. How does this change if there's some wind? Let's say we've got wind from this direction. And so suddenly flying from right to left is upwind. And so it's hard to fly upwind. So our, our, uh, glide slope is steeper on this side, whereas flying downwind is pretty easy. So suddenly some people who would have had glide to the LZ don't if they're having to fly upwind to get there and they're going to come out short. Again, obviously way too steep, but you get the idea. So for, for cross-country flying, I think it's useful to turn this over. So let's, uh, let's draw another one. Let's say we've got here we are in our paraglider, and we can draw like this. And what is this showing us then? It's showing where, us where, where we can where, get to. Where we can get to, right. So we can get to a, 
a field that's here and we can't get to a field that's there. And uh, I'm, I'm drawing it uh, in two dimensions, but obviously it's a, actually a cone in different directions. And the same kind of thing happens with wind. If we, if we say wind is this way again, then we can't fly into wind very well. So we can only go to there, whereas suddenly downwind, we can go to there. And um, this is obviously why it's easy to fly cross country going downwind. You get to cover a lot more ground and a lot more possible thermal triggers on the way. And so you're, it's easier to stay in the air just flying downwind. And so a lot of cross country flights are downwind. And that's, that's a good way to start. Um, uh, unless it means like going over the back at brace. Because going over the back at brace, the first thing you have to do is fly over a couple miles of trees. And even if you're fairly high, that's going to feel unnerving. So at brace, um, I would say the best the best way to start is to just pick a field that's in the brace valley that's not the LZ. And uh, aim for that field or so and the good news is the valley has lots of fields. So if you get to that one and you notice it's smaller than you thought, there will be a bigger one nearby. You'll have you'll have options. And if you go and examine it, you, you might find a climb. You might be able to come back to the LZ if you want to. So one of the things you can do is start to train yourself without going anywhere, just by evaluating every single field that you can see while you're flying. What about that one? What would that be like? Okay, in this wind direction, this wind strength, what would that be like? We'll, we'll talk in a few minutes about where to set up and some things to think about, but um, start to evaluate fields uh, uh, that, that you're flying over. And even if you have no intention of going cross country that day, so there's one basic thing, which I know you all know from your training, but I just want to review it because I think it's 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 helpful. Let's say that. There's also a hand raised, James. Sorry. OK, I'm not seeing the hand. OK, there we are. Peter, please go ahead. Peter, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was just I was just asking, right? My question would be more starting off the XC, right? Getting things going. You send it, you know, to cloud base at brace. You uh, you swallow the fears, you go over the back, and now what? How do you how do you find the next climb? You know, what's the What's the secret for the for the invisible lifty line that you know you're gonna connect that next little hill that's back there and then aim for the uh, you know for those big pastures with the cows that you can smell the thermos there and just keep going further and further. That's um, you know. I'm uh, let's. That's a great question. How to find the next thermal is one of the the uh, great mysteries, and uh, we'll we'll talk more about that. A little bit later so i'm going to leave you with a tease for the moment and we'll, we'll we will come back to that um the big thing if you go over the back at brace if that's if that's uh what you did you suddenly you were at seven thousand feet over launch well what the heck i know i've got glide to go downwind over the back okay so go over the back uh and you will absolutely make it well to the other side with lots of room and then what do you got to do you got to pick a field and you got to do that. So make that your priority if you aren't used to it yet. Get over the back and start looking at fields and find one to land in. You might just blunder into a thermal and then you can decide, okay, do I want to keep going? And it's fine to keep going as long as you have another field that you can get to. Um, but we'll come back to the business of how you find the next thermal. So let's start, say there's no wind and we have some glide options. So let's say this is our glide at trim. Where does our glide with speed bar get us? Uh, 
Is it going to be shorter, longer, or shorter? It depends or on the wing direction. There's wind no wind direction. right now. No so wind. That's shorter. Short, shorter, faster. Shorter, <laughs> right. So what about our glide holding some brake? Shorter, slower. Depends also. how much, right? I mean, best glide, isn't that a little bit of brake? Best glide and no wind on most paragliders is trim, just okay. hands up. It's at least close to that. So we will assume that that's correct for this discussion. It's it's pretty close. Um, so we don't know whether brake or bar will go farther. That depends how much brake, how much bar, and what our glider's polar curve looks like and so on. But I haven't drawn them on top of each other just so that we can see. So, okay, so trim trim goes the farthest. Bar will get us to the ground the quickest, and break will get us to the ground also short, but um, but uh, slower, slower descent. Okay, let's do that again. And let's say um, we've got wind this time, and the wind is this way. So our, our glide at trim looks like that. Where is speed bar now? Further, I think. Let's see. Uh, it's going to get you more penetration. Will the speed bar be longer or shorter? Longer. Longer is correct. Someone pass him a banana. Um, and what happens with brake? Shorter. Yeah, shorter. Slower, but shorter. Oops, sorry. So in all cases, bar gets you to the ground the fastest, but in into wind, it also gets you the farthest. So if you're trying to get somewhere, like say to a landing field that's over here, bar can help you do that. Why does bar make you go further? That's a good question. Well, what happens when I press the speed bar? Speed up. I speed up, right. Um, and so let's 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 look at a, a strong example. Let's say that we've got so much wind that glide at trim looks like this. That means that the wind is exactly. See, yeah. It all makes sense all of a sudden, yeah. Right. So at trim, I'm going to be hovering straight down from wherever I am. On break, obviously, I'll be going backwards. And suddenly, bar lets me go farther, advance into the wind. So the, that's, the, that's the thought problem that um, hopefully makes that clear. The same, the same thing happens, and you can do the math if you want. Um, it's an extra credit problem. You can hand it in next week. Um, it, the same thing happens when the wind is weaker. So you're still moving forward at trim. Okay, let's look at another one. So let's say we've got wind this time, this direction. And we're still headed that way ourselves. So let's say that's trim. Where is bar now? You're not going to use your bar. You're going downwind. Well, if I'm trying to maximize my glide, I won't use my bar. But if I did, where is where is it going to put me? Shorter. Longer, shorter further than back, trim. Huh? I'm sorry. Further back. I don't. Know. Further back. That's right. I'm going to get to the ground sooner um, because bar degrades your glide. Trim is best glide. And um, best glide in still air. Bar's glide is worse than that. 
You have more speed, but worse glide. Where is brake going to put us? You're going to stall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try, try not to pull that much brake, but will brake be longer or shorter than trim? Longer. Shorter also, no? No, actually. Actually, because the wind is pushing you. Yeah, it's going to. Okay. So if you want to maximize your glide over ground downwind, holding a little bit of brake will um, do that. I actually made use of this one time in, at Valle, boy, a long time ago now. Um, and I was doing some mild tricks over the lake. And I did like one lower, I was doing asymmetric spirals because I'm really, really familiar with those. So I'm confident I'm not gonna get the wing into a, a ball. And and I did like one too many. And so now I'm like a quarter mile out in the lake and it sure doesn't look like I have glide to the shore. <laughs> and it's there's a, a little bit of breeze blowing toward the shore. Oh, and so I straightened out and I pulled a little bit of break and I sat still and I could see people on the LZ. Everybody was sprinting to get their cameras. It was pretty funny. And I disappointed them because I got just to the shore and I made a 90 degree turn and landed two feet from the water and the glider fell over onto the dry land. And um, if I hadn't held break, I'd have been in the water for sure. And that's because of this diagram. Okay, so so, even, so James, even in a comp and a task or whatever, because I thought that I thought you know you're always <laughs> on bar because you want to try to get to the next thermal as quick as, as quick as possible. No, well, it's that's really a question about pace, which we're not going to talk about too much today. But uh, to your question, um, if it's a strong day. And then you're really confident you're going to get to the next thermal before you right. land. It's like a three meter day or a four meter day or something. Like that. Yeah. Right. If the thermals are strong and they're frequent enough that you're quite confident about not landing, then yeah, everybody's flying full bar on glide all the way around the course. But that's only on a day like that. And um, if the conditions are weaker, uh, if the if the thermals are slow, let's look at another another thing here. So um, let's say uh, if you're if you've got a you know syllabus, I don't want to it or whatever. Like this, don't worry about it. No, that's it's but, it's, it's, it's interesting. So if if there's a thermal that's climbing slowly and I go there on speed bar, I get get to it lower. If I go there on trim, I get to it higher. So yeah. the the calculation is always, okay, I get there more quickly on speed bar, but can I climb up to this place before the person who was on half bar gets there? And yeah. if it's a weak, if it's a weak climb, the answer will be no. It'll be right. better to fly half bar and get there. Right. Um, uh, meanwhile, if the if it's another kind of thermal that you know does one of those, right? Then that means full bar wherever I get there is the, by far the most important because I'm going to be doing that, and anybody who comes along anything less than that, um, I'll be up here. You're already up to the top or whatever, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Good to know. So one other thing that, before we leave this topic of what happens with glide with wind in different directions. So we looked at no no wind. We looked at wind from flying into wind. We looked at stronger wind flying into wind. We looked at flying downwind. And so let's say that we've got no wind again. So it, let's just come back to that one. What if we've got no wind, but we've got sink? Let's say we've got a whole chunk of sinking air. So I'm gonna draw another glider here. 
and let's say he's he's got a whole lot of sync to fly through. Fly fast through sync and slow through lift. So at trim, I can get the right color here. I won't exactly match the slope I had, but now at trim, I'm not flying very fast. My glide's going to degrade a lot in the sink, and then it will come back to being what it was. And let's say that the sink continues there. Meanwhile, on speed bar, my glide will also degrade, but less. And if the sink is strong, it may it may be really important to be on a lot of bar because a strong sink can just put you all the way on the ground. So it turns out to look just like flying into wind. Flying through sink and flying into wind um, do exactly the same things to your glide and to your to what happens with your bar and your brake. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's sort of like in a car, if you go around a turn and the turn goes off camber or the radius gets tighter, it does exactly the same thing to the, your car's behavior. Okay. Any questions on this stuff? Just a comment. I've been doing that a little more that it's the same thing, basically, where we tend to treat where I tended to treat sync as sort of a accepted thing. And now I kind of try to spend as much effort getting out of sync as I do finding lift. Yeah. Um, sync, sync isn't what we want. <laughs> right. But it's like, but yeah, but you, I used to be sort of like, well, it's some sync, but now I'm like, all right, I got to get out of this as quick as I can. Yeah, and if you're if you're flying straight and and you hit a bunch of sink, sometimes that means the climb is right there. That's right, just like right. on the other side of it. Yeah. But no, if, if it's short, it if it's going, short, I'm always like, oh, here comes the thermal. But if it's you know after ten seconds, I'm like, all right, I'm I gotta, you know, yeah, go and so fly or fly faster or whatever. But yeah, and you might want to change angle because yeah. you might be in a. a convergence works both ways. You might be in a convergence of 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 sinking air, right? Um, so, if you if that's if you stay in it for a while and it's not changing or it's getting stronger, then yeah, veer All sideways. Yeah, some angle to one side or the other, or whatever. Yeah, or thirty. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a fun one. How do you know if you're going to clear a ridge on glide? This is something you'll run into a lot in cross country flying. And in New England, we don't have big mountains, but we have lots of small ones and lots of hills and things. I think Paco yes. mentioned a trick recently uh, where you do this over a course of a few flights in different wind speeds, uh, and you pick up, you put your foot out in front of you, and you pick a point on the horizon and see if it's coming up or down or staying there. And uh, that gives you a very rough idea of your glide. Did yeah. I translate that correctly? I might have screwed that up. No, that's a that's the right idea. So you you can use your foot or your toe or the front of your pod, um, but I think you you can also visualize it. So let's say this is the 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 front of my pod here, and my riser is going up like that. And I've got a ridge in front of me. And I'm wondering if I'm gonna if I'm gonna clear it. And for for this method, it doesn't matter what the wind direction is or what the wind strength is or whether you're you're flying through sink or lift, all of that just gets taken into account. And basically the rule is if if the ridge is going like this in my field of view, I'm gonna clear it. And if the ridge is going like this in my field of view, I'm not going to clear it. And if it's staying in exactly the same place, that means that's where I'm aiming. 
is right at the top of the ridge. So if I'm aiming right at the top of the ridge, then what's the next big thing that I worry about for what to do next? Where you're going to land. Road. Uh, I, I like that. So hopefully I've got a landing field in mind. Um, what else? Rotor. What else? Sorry. I said rotor. Rotor. Okay. And rotor is an effect of what? Mechanical turbulence, wind. Wind direction. Wind. So wind rears its head again. Yeah. And rotor, rotor on my ridge in front of me here would happen if the wind is coming from what direction? The other side. Headwind. Right. So Same. if the wind is, if I'm flying into the wind, then this whole face here has a strong risk of rotor. We'll talk more about lee side stuff later at the end if you guys have any energy. That's a little bit of an advanced topic, but um, lots to say about it. So yeah, I, I probably, if the wind is coming over this ridge toward me, um, unless it's on unusual conditions and I'm somehow confident, I probably don't want to proceed to the X point there. I want to turn away, go some other place, fly down the ridge to the right or left, or even be content to make a safe landing in Shani's big field here. Meanwhile, if the, if, the, if the wind is going the other way, if I'm flying with a tailwind. You might actually might... get lift over there. Right, and particularly if there's sunshine, let's say that um, there's sun on this on this side, the sun's behind me and I'm flying downwind. Now I feel completely confident flying toward that X because with, a, with the upslope from the sunshine and the wind blowing up the slope, I'm unlikely to have severe turbulence. I might have thermal turbulence. So I might not want to go in and fly one wingspan away from the mountain, but but I can fly that direction um, and I won't have rotor and very good chance I'll run into a thermal. And if I don't, I can, I can simply turn to one side or the other and fly along and probably find a thermal. And, and then once I'm high, then I can carry on straight ahead to the other side of that ridge because crossing this ridge high will keep me out of the rotor that's on the other side. Well, I have a question, comment. I've used this rule lately uh, when I try to go XC, uh, but I noticed that you need to put a buffer on where you're going to land because you might encounter sink and headwind, uh, well, mainly sink along the way. So if it seems like you're going to make it, you might not necessarily, depending on it, how far distance you're covering. There's many more variables to cross yeah so so, do you do you add a buffer yeah i think actually you you just kind of brought up a crucial thing about doing this safely um and it's true whether you're coming to a ridge or whether there's a you're just flying on the flats and there are fields out there ahead of you which which field are you going to get to and if if you're pointed at that field right now, yeah, there's no presumption you're really going to get there. You might well have sink on the way there. You might only get halfway there. So um, buffer, the, the word I usually use, but buffer is fine, is margin. So keep a margin in all your calculations. And when you start, be conservative. Be what feels like stupidly conservative. Oh, so I, I can get to a field that's, that's out here. So I aim at a field that's here. Um, and I'm, I've drawn that poorly. Uh, let's just scroll down. Um, so there's fields out in the distance. So 
I think I, I'm currently aiming at that one. That's the one that's not moving in my windscreen. You can think of it like, like the windscreen on a sailplane and the the place that's not moving is the place you're pointed to so if you imagine that you're you're looking through the the glass bubble on a sailplane um there there'll be some place that's not moving um and that's what whoever's whoever was talking about it mark was it that you put your toe on that place okay that's since your toe is not moving in your field of view, then you get the idea, okay, that's what's not moving. I think you can you can tell that pretty well without having to use your toe, but it's, it's, I don't mind if you want to use your toe. One thing that can be helpful is if you have two ridges and one of them is going like this, whoops. One of them is going like that, okay, and I'm expecting to clear that one, but the other one's going like this. Okay, the place that's not moving is somewhere in between. So that means right now at my current glide, I'm expecting to clear the first one and not the second one. And if I run into some sink and the first one starts to do this, then I'm not headed for that X anymore. I've got a new X that might be here. So let's come back to what you were saying. Yeah, don't don't presume you're going to get as far as it currently looks like you are. Um, if you think you're going to go to the field with the X, then make this your your current field that you're aiming for. Um, and if you get there high or you find another thermal on the way, great, you can carry on. But if there's no field, like. Let's say there's there isn't any field there, but there is a field here. So which field can I aim at now? Well, it's the same thing, isn't it? It's this one. And if this is all Western Massachusetts and there's 5,000 trees, I can't afford to aim for, for the far field where the X is. I have to aim for the one that I've circled and then see if I get a climb. And if I don't get a climb, then I land there. And it's always okay to land. Wherever you got, then you're standing there on a field, it's a beautiful day. Well, in Tom Lanning's case, he has to pack because it's gonna rain in five minutes, but, but often it's a beautiful day, it's a beautiful afternoon. You just successfully flew thousands of feet in the air and a few miles over the ground and landed safely in a strange field it's great stuff. It doesn't matter how far you went. Does that answer your question, Shani? Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks. Okay. So, yeah, always keep a margin. So, here's one Should you go with your friends? So, what are some reasons you might want to go with your friends? Carpooling. Carpooling, yeah. Uh, combing the sky more effectively and having uh, signals of lift. Pimping off each other. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll let Team Flying cover both of those. Um, That's what I meant. Yeah. What else? safety it's, it's fun to be with your friends if uh and if something does happen it's great to have people around who maybe saw where you threw your reserve and um can help people find you hopefully you're fine but you might need some help so all those things are are true and it's fun it's fun to plan flights with people it's fun to go with your friends and uh land together what's your reason not to fly with your friends uh, they have different goals than you have. They might have very different goals. Or skills. Experience, yeah. They might just not be ready. You're ready 
to start flying cross country, they're not ready. You talked about it, but now you're a thousand feet, 2000 feet above launch at brace and they're doodling around. They can't climb up, whatever. So there's another big one to me, which is cross country flying is really a huge exercise in self-reliance. And if you have other people around, I think you learn that less well. So particularly when you're starting, but really anytime, I think it's great to be willing to go by yourself because I can't pick a landing field because Tom Lanning's two miles ahead and he's landing there. So I know it's okay. I'm, he'll even uh, give me a sign which way the wind's blowing when I get there. That's like, I've got a windsock. If he's not there, now I've got to make my own decision. Which of these fields is going to be good for me to land in? And which one doesn't have a six foot high vegetation in it? And um, what yeah. about the wind and all that kind of stuff? So um, don't wait for your friends. Don't wait for a perfect day. Um, get, uh, get a little altitude and plan for your first field whatever your first field is, and leave. And if you fly three kilometers and you land safely, uh, first round's on me. I, all I care about is that you land safely. The people I love in cross country are the people that go cross country every day and they land safely every day and no sketchy bullshit. And that's not always me. I'm like not always a great example. I have some some sketchiness in my history but i do try to stay i do try to not put myself in that situation and i hope you won't questions what about this you need different equipment go across country one thing i always tell people when they're starting cross country is to have some sort of uh tracker so that uh you know if the unexpected happens somebody can find them as opposed to you know something happening you know around your flying site where other people are most likely going to see yeah i think that's a good one you you, you should have a tracker um I really prefer the inreaches myself. One of the nice things about an inreach is if I land in a place with no cell service, I can send a text message to any cell phone that does have cell service through the inreach, through the satellite, and I can receive a reply on my phone through the inreach. And if someone else has landed in a place with no cell service, I can send them a text inreach to inreach to their phone. And that I've only used that about three times, but man, it's incredibly useful when you need it and someone's trying to find you and you're you're on some back road or or whatever it is. Um, in terms of an incident, um, let's say that I'm flying downwind here and uh, the last known on me is this spot. I've got the 10 minute pings happening. Well, people looking at my track will see, okay, he's flying the, this direction. It's not always quite that clear, of course. I might have a ping here and a ping there. But even if we know my direction pretty well, so we can draw sort of a cone of where I might be, 10 minutes is far. And it turns out that, that if that's the next 10-minute mark, if I'm flying, uh, let's say, an average of 30 miles an hour in that direction, um, or even 25 miles an hour. Um, let's say it's, it, if it's 30 miles an hour, that means that in 10 minutes, I'm gonna fly how far? Five miles. Five miles, right. So this is suddenly five miles. And so this, the area of this triangle isn't small. So if you've crashed in the open and you're not, lying on top of your inReach, it will keep sending signals from where you are. So it's really great in that circumstance. <clears throat> if you've crashed through a tree canopy, and maybe you're not injured, but you're hanging from a tree or something, 
they don't tend to work under tree canopies and unless there's like a hole you could get lucky with holes but um, the testing i've done it's not reliable under a tree canopy and if you crash and you're you're lying on top with your harness on top of your inreach that won't work either so it's not a panacea and you shouldn't assume that that um people will know exactly where you are but it's certainly much better than nothing what else what about your instrument and the fields on your instrument um Oh, well, you definitely want, uh, before answering the fields, the attributes you want, the, you would like to have an extra battery charger for um, your connectivity, both if you use your phone as your instrument, but also to um, communicate once you learn land. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of fields, it's like a glide to next like the glide ratio you need to get to the next point well a point means you've got a route planned um and if you have a if you have a route planned with waypoint glide ratio to a waypoint is like let's say that we our waypoint is there and we're gliding along and we need 10 to 1 glide to get to the waypoint or whatever the number is. Well, that's 10 to 1 glide to the ground. And if I want to, unless that's gold, if that, unless that's where the ice cream store is, uh, probably I want to continue. So I think glide to next, even in competitions, it's not very helpful. Some people use it, and I don't want to argue with them. Some of them fly better than I do. but. Um, uh, Okay. Well, let's... So the more obvious one is your average climb rate and the wind direction, wind indicator. So glide over ground is really important. Um, uh, climb rate is, is the variable. Let's come back to that in a moment. Um, if you didn't have an instrument that calculated wind speed and direction, how would you have an idea of what the wind is? Uh, somebody else can answer. <laughs> I, I know the answer though. Well, you've got one thing, which is your ground speed. I'm listing over here the fields you really want to have. And I think it's really good to keep the list short. It's possible with all our instruments to get out 99 fields that tell us all kinds of stuff. The simpler you can keep it, the better. The, everything that you don't really need is, is a complication, a complexity, and um, there's a real virtue in simplicity when you've already got all these hard questions to pay attention to. More fields become a huge distraction, I think. So ground speed is one. So I should have an idea of my glider, my glider's uh, airspeed while climbing, while flying a trim, and while on bar. And there I might have half bar and full bar. How do I get these? Since there's always some wind. Well, climbing's pretty easy because I'm making circles. So I just watch my airspeed and it'll it'll drop to something, let's say 22 kilometers per hour going this way, and then it'll be 38 kilometers per hour going this way, or whatever it is. So halfway in between those is my airspeed while I'm climbing. The, these are ground speed figures. These are from this one, of course, since we don't have airspeed indicators on paragliders. So um, 38 minus 22, 16 divided by two is eight. That means 30K is my airspeed while climbing. So 
if I look down while I'm climbing and I notice it's going something different, let me ask the question differently. What's the wind speed here? Eight. Eight. Eight K wind, right. And it's coming this direction. So if this looks a lot different, this this might be sometime this might be 10k and then this might be 50k. Then obviously the wind is how much there? 20. 20. So much windier. So while I'm while I'm climbing, I can have a really good idea about these things. The other ones, trim um, and and bar, you can test those by just when you're out at your hill sometime, fly upwind and downwind, you know which way the wind is, and watch your ground speed and subtract one from the other like this and Figure out what these speeds are. Uh, James? But, yeah. I also use ground speed to determine wind direction as well. If I point into the wind and then whichever way I point gives me the slowest ground speed, then that's the direction of wind. Yep. So that's that's another thing is you can get the direction of the wind by pointing and watching your ground speed. So as Tom said, wherever it's the minimum, okay, now you're pointed straight into the wind. And flying downwind, wherever it's the maximum, now you're pointed straight downwind. So the instruments that are that are giving you a wind calculation, uh, they're useful, but they're not. Um, it's really good to have this, these skills um, under your hat or under your belt or wherever it is when we keep skills um, uh, as well. And the, the instruments will sometimes give you funny ideas. Some of the instruments are just measuring your thermal drift while you're circling. And thermals you've heard of thermal blocking, sometimes the wind blows around thermals and the wind, your thermal drift may be a lot less than the wind speed nearby on a particular day. Um, so don't assume that your instrument's wind indication is the, is the full story. Um, hey, one thing I just came to mind, I, I remember finding this out on one, a flight one time in, um, I, I think it was in France, I was struggling to get to a certain field because I wasn't sure if I was going to make it. And then I decided to turn downwind and all of a sudden there was like five fields because you're all of a sudden it's like you got an engine behind you, <laughs> you know, because you got all these options that open up because I'm going to cover this massive amount of territory versus if I'm fighting my way down to this one hill I fixated on or one, one field I fixated on. You know what I mean? That's a great point. Um... It's really easy to fixate on a field that you had an idea about. And um, and if you're flying crosswind or upwind to try to get there, yeah, it's much harder to get there. And if there are fields downwind, um, then uh, that's, a, that's a great thing to be open to. Keep looking around. Don't assume that you have the right answer. Keep right. asking, right. Keep, keep asking the question. Anyway. Let's come back to the Vario. So, Shawnee, you, you mentioned um, uh, the, uh, uh, an, a, what did you call it? An averager, right? Mm -hmm. I learned it from you. Okay, so there's an instant Vario, and your audio is always instant, and you want it to be instant because that's what you're using to center your circle and to to just be aware moment to moment of what 
going up and down is. And then you can have a display, which is the average. Pretty much all instruments, if you configure the displayed vario field, you have a choice of whether to make it instant or to have it average, and you'll have a choice of times. Something like 20 seconds is a good thing. What that does for you, it, it, if the averager is showing you the last 20 seconds, it's showing you basically one full circle. What was the average of your lift there? Because lift can be very sharp at some, some side of the circle and the instant very, if you have your display set to instant, it might say five meters per second or a thousand feet per minute or something. And, and you think, wow, this is a great thermal. But if the rest of the, the circle is really thrashy and you're, and you're even in sync and then you're going up and then you're in sync, um, you're not actually climbing very fast. And so what an averager does is it gives you an idea of the quality of the thermal. And if, if the thermal feels like what I just said, and you look at the average and it says one meter per second, unless you're low, go find another one because there's probably a much better one not very far away. Um, and then sometimes you want an instant display, but the only time I use that is while on glide. And then it, that, that lets me notice just little changes in the air that I'm gliding through. So I would, I would leave that off for the time being and use the averager for the display and get used to that and the instant for the audio. <laughs> Does that make sense? What other fields might I want to have? Altitude. Sorry, go ahead. Altitude. Altitude. And if your instrument does it, you might want to have two altitudes. One is MSL, which lets you know what the thermal tops are and how your climbs are doing and so on, because that doesn't change as the terrain underneath you changes. AGL above ground level is obviously about how high you are above ground. So that will change as you go over a hill. So it, you wouldn't usually want AGL by itself. MSL is a reference for the day and where cloud base is and how cloud base is going up in the course of the afternoon and those sorts of things. Um, you might want AGL. AGL has, a, since I think maybe since I didn't fly with it for the first few years I was flying, AGL tends to make me nervous because I kind of I'll kind of look at it and go, oh, God, I'm only I'm only a thousand feet above the ground, where MSL says I'm four thousand feet or something. Um, so I don't use it very much myself, but um, if you're interested to know how high you are above the ground, that will obviously do that. What else might you want? Airspace. Airspace, once you start to go far enough to fly around airspace, um, then yeah, some some display of airspace. And and at that point you need a map and a map that you can zoom in and out. It's good to see airspace when you're fairly zoomed out so that you can plan. You just don't suddenly get a warning from your instrument. You're one kilometer from airspace and and the, the thing looks like this. This is a tap view now. Like, oh, that's one kilometer. So suddenly I've been flying this direction. I've got to do something crazy. And there might not be a thermal in that direction. So the, the difference is if I have more warning, then it looked like a circle like that from 20 miles away. And I can make a plan in advance. But I don't think you need airspace to get started. I think this is really a good list. Glide over ground. And you learn so much from glide over ground. You learn about sync. You learn about 
headwind or wind uh, wind strength and direction um, gl with glide over ground and ground speed, um, the vario and the altitude. One that you might want to add if you don't have it is distance to takeoff. Lots of instruments have that as an option. And the reason that's handy, yes, it can be satisfying to look down and say, wow, I've flown 23K since I took off then. Holy cow, that's that's fun. But it also means that when Tom Lanning calls you on the radio and says, where are you? You can say, I'm, I'm north, northeast of Brace, uh, about 23K from takeoff. Um, so that gives gives people who might be talking to you or trying to catch up with you or something, a, a pretty clear idea of where you are. And it would be hard to, at least I don't, I don't find I can estimate those distances in my head very well, just sort of looking back or looking forward. In theory, you also need a compass to, if you, so if you're getting stuck in a cloud, that you can keep a bearing to get out. But ideally, you don't get into a cloud. Yeah, I try not to get into clouds. But um, if you think there's any chance of getting into a cloud, yeah, some some kind of a, a compass on your instrument can be good, or a bearing, like you said. Um, when you're in a cloud, you can't fly straight. You think you can. You think, okay, I'm just going to be centered. I'm going to just sit quietly and same break tension and you'll look at your compass and you're just going around in a gentle circle and you you cannot do that by feel um i've, uh, I've read about this in books um so um some kind of compass is good a little ball compass that you can get for 10 for 10 bucks from amazon just with a safety pin Put it on your flight deck somewhere now if you get into a cloud by the way if you get pulled into a cloud you better have a chance you want to make sure you have a chance to look around before you get pulled in you okay you've screwed up you can't avoid getting pulled in now but you know where the closest edge of the cloud is um and you you know which way you want to fly when you can't see anymore so um then you can use your compass. Okay, I'm, I'm going to fly southeast to get out of here and then just fly southeast. So that's a good one. And yeah, it's worth having a compass. And yeah, it's also worth trying to keep more of a margin so you don't actually get into clouds much. Uh, James? Yeah. Yeah, I, I it's funny, just my uh, last two days of flying here that you know, uh, uh, just like uh, GPS signals and the inReach uh, don't work exceptionally well under trees, if you're under very tall and wet clouds, uh, you'll also lose, can lose GPS signal. Uh, so reiterating what you said, you know, a compass, an old school compass uh, has value even over the electronic ones that are based off of uh, GPS signals. I yes, I agree with that. Um, I had something else. What was it? All right. Oh. Sorry. No, that's good. Um, you you made me think of something, and now I can't think of it, but it'll come back. So. When you leave to go cross country, say you haven't done it before, only a couple times, do you need a flight plan when you go? Helps, definitely. No. What, needs clear. Be, what needs to be in the flight plan, Jim? Uh, bailouts, bailout zones, and uh, you know, you need to have alternate landing zones. So. I think you could even make that singular. You need one alternate landing zone when you leave. You need one field that you know you can get to that you're confident you can land safely in. So flight plan when you're getting started can be really simple. 
as you get better and you have more experience, get more comfortable, you can add things and try to do more complicated flights. But to get started, it can be really simple. You, you can be high over launch at your home site and you've got a field that you're pretty sure you can get to. And as you start to, as you start to glide there, uh, it's, let's say this one in the middle is, is the home landing zone. And I think I'm gonna glide to this one on the right. And as I start to go, if I run into some headwind and I'm not getting there anymore, then I can divert. Go back home. <laughs> And come back to this one, and uh, and that's what you're. That's what you want to be doing all the way along your flight. Like, okay, I think I can go there, um, and I'm going to try to go there. But I'm I'm not going to give up on my last one until I know I can get there. So, since we're talking a lot about getting started at cross country, I want to emphasize that when you're getting started, you don't need a big complicated plan. You need a field, maybe it's one you've seen from the air before, maybe it's one you can see from the air today, and hopefully it's even a clump, like the Brace Valley has lots of fields. So even though it's not straight downwind, you can just go north on the Brace Valley, see if you can get to Hillsdale, and maybe you'll only get a third of the way there, but you did it, you stayed, you, you kept a some field within glide all the way and eventually you went back to one of those and landed in it i've landed at every single one of those fields on the way to hillsdale i'm pretty sure um and it's a and, and then you've done it you've done a cross-country flight you've evaluated you've landed safely and there you are on the ground it's it's a satisfying thing to do it doesn't matter how far you went Instruments we've talked about. Okay. We're going to cover. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where to go next? How do you find oh. thermals? Yeah. Okay. So, a long time ago, there's a guy named John Wanamaker who was an advertising. I know he, he ran some kind of big business and he said, had a famous quote. He said, I know half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. I just don't know which half. And I like to borrow that to talk about thermals. And there's all this lore about where to go look for a thermal. And you know half the lore is wrong, but you don't know which half. And people love to talk about like a tractor. Oh, if there's a tractor plowing a field, go to the tractor, you'll climb out. But you know somebody's landed next to a tractor and they just didn't say anything. So um, I don't think tractors are automatically triggers um, sometimes. Um, one thing that does seem persistently helpful is to, uh, you know, I'm sure you've heard this one, but imagine coating the earth with honey, turning the earth over and where will the honey drip? So it drips off hills and ridges and even tree lines, like a bare field and then a tree line with a road, that's a place where, um, where a thermal might release. So the thing to keep in mind is that the sunshine isn't heating the air. The, it's sort of the wrong wavelength. The sunshine heats the ground. The ground re-radiates at longer wavelengths and heats the air next to it. So you get these puddles of warm air and they don't necessarily release right away. Um, and that's complicated um, and probably should have a meteorologist to talk about because I don't know very much about that. But often these puddles will blow down wind and then they'll come to a hill and then they'll release there in a plume going up or, a, or bubbles going up. Um, but any change on the ground, a bare field to a tree line or a small hill um, and Really, I think it's a, a lot like the stock market. On a good day, everything you pick goes up and you think you're smart. So, and that just means that on a good day, all the stocks are going up. And on a good day, there are lots of thermals around and you will blunder into them. 
you don't uh and it feels like you're smart because oh wow look at this clam i got but um i studied uh donizetti's track log from petersburg pass when he flew 100 miles back to his house and um more than once he was going toward a ridge where you would go you would think okay there might be a thermal releasing on that ridge and on the way there he'd hit a thermal and if you open if you open the track log in google earth and you look back down the the uh circles which all which are blowing with the wind you can look back down the the tube and sort of see where that thermal might have released it's some little hill in the valley so it wasn't from the ridge he was going to the ridge and there might have been a thermal there too but um on a good day you you'll run into a lot of things and you you try to make decisions that put you in the way of them a little more but but it's really it's really a lot of an art um it's also that's another good art to practice by yourself um, when you're flying with your friends it's much easier and when you're team flying or in a competition there are all these people ahead of you um well usually and you can there will be people climbing over here and not climbing over there. Well, where are you going to go? It's, you don't have to think very long about that. Does that answer your question, Shani? Well, yeah, um, but no, because I know the theory of where to look next. But when you're in the air, there's so many possibilities of where to go because we travel in three-dimensional space. So... I have I have a, some thoughts. One could be, well, what time of day is it? Is the sun had a long time to heat up the rocks, mm -hmm. or is it uh, closer to when the sun sun first started radiating and and something that might give off heat a little sooner? There's wind direction. There's trees, a tree line that kind of cups the wind uh, a little bit for that particular day, and has some different color terrain compared to the surrounding terrain that might be a spot but like james says it's it's just a hope and you'll probably find what you're looking for on the way to that spot very often but sunshine is a big deal and so your point's a great one and um slopes that are facing the sun or have been facing the sun like uh east facing slopes in the morning um if you've ever flown Greylock, you know wow that that starts early and and that front slope works until it gets shady until it's been shady for a while and then the other side works better so sun's really a big deal and if you have a choice of going to a ridge where there's sunshine and shade um and let's say you're on the upwind side of the ridge to because you're we're keeping a big margin and we want to stay safe um go where the sunshine is um we've all been on launch where it'll it's kind of dead and then it, the sun comes out or the cloud moves away and suddenly we've got cycles coming up so watch the sunshine that's that's another one that's really uh, a big deal and uh if the clouds if the if you, the cumulus clouds are getting have more coverage let's say they're not turning into thunderstorms but they're they're blocking more of the sun the cloud shadows on the ground sometimes you can get a thermal to trigger when the shadow uh, as the shadow is moving uh, at the edge of the shadow but that's maybe a little like the tractor like maybe I thought that's what was happening but really there was a bump there or um but for sure, big areas of shade moving in will will shut things down um, and can just put you on the ground. So sunshine's a big factor. What yeah. else? Am I, am I another, well, I just mean like if you know where to look for them, but you still didn't find something, then what? Then you make a safe landing. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it's disappointing <laughs> to like <laughs> bomb out and yeah yeah sometimes it's really disappointing sometimes you might gnash your teeth for two days you were 4k short of goal on a 110k task and 
and you were in eighth place and then you couldn't find a climb and everybody flew over your head. Yeah, it's really irritating, <laughs> but it happens. James, I had a way of thinking about things that I'm sure there's a better way to think about it, but at some point in your flight, when you get close enough to the clouds, I, I kind of look at them like a vacuum cleaner that's being held over a carpet. If you're too, if the vacuum cleaner is too far away from the carpet, it's not going to pull up the dirt. But if the carpet or the lift or you starts getting closer to that vacuum cleaner, now you're going to start feeling the effects of those clouds, those that are sucking the lift towards them. Uh, I guess it's a nice, it's nice. I don't know. Okay. Um, is there a better way to think of that? And and as second part of that question would be. How do you see a cloud building versus dissipating? I, you know, it's hard to have the patience to to look at a cloud that long and figure that out. Clouds are really hard because they always look like a cloud, right? And you do another circle, and it still looks like a cloud. So trying to trying to remember it clearly enough to tell what changed over the last circle or the last five circles. It's really challenging. Um, it's still worth doing because uh, clouds that that are three miles away or a little ways away and um, um, that are robust now, by the time you get there, they might not be working. Clouds have a pretty short life cycle on a lot of summer days. Um, you want to go to the ones that are just starting now so that when you get there, they're more robust. And unless they're close, in which case it's easier. Um, coming back to your first question, there's a model that Carrie Castle likes to use that I think is pretty good, which is she divides the sky into, into three layers. And uh, if you're up here, you're flying the clouds. And if you're if if you're down here. You're flying the ground. You're looking for ground triggers, which is all the stuff we were just talking about. And if you're in here, then maybe it's some of both. And if you're low, like here, then you can just think, okay, I just launched. Well, you don't sink out after you just launched. You find a thermal. So don't panic if you get a little low. Keep a landing field in mind, just like when you when you launch the LZs over there. So you've got a landing field. And as long as you've got a landing field, you can focus on finding a thermal. And if you don't find one, then you land. And, and if you do, maybe you get a low save out of it. And the only requirement for a low save is that you've got a landing field that, that, uh, that you don't lose while you're trying to climb. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But so to the first part of your question, on, on a great day, uh, you're, you're up here and you leave and, and then you get another thermal under the next cloud. And then you, then you leave from there. And um, the, the open distance record flight from Brace that I did, I connected more clouds together than I ever have in a row anywhere else um and it didn't start out like that it, uh it was about noon i had no idea it was going to be that good a day um uh zoe i think was the only other person on launch she was in the slot nothing was happening she um backed out to watch for a minute i got in the slot the first week thing that came i took off and I almost landed in the LZ. I was, I had a low save at the LZ. Uh, and by the time I, I, and that, that climb went all the way back up. And by the time it, it, it got me back up, I was under the first cloud of the day. And then the clouds just, just went like that all the way to Vermont. So I was, I didn't look at a ground trigger until after I got to Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, the, the climbs were really slow. Like, one and a half meters per second. So it was a weekday somehow. 
or the record would be longer, but, um, but it was a magic day. Um, but most days won't be like that. You might string a couple clouds together and then, and then you'll be coming in down here and looking for a low climb. And so don't be hard on yourself if you didn't get to the next cloud. That's more common. And, um, a really good day in Florida or an exceptionally good day in New England, you might string a number of clouds together, but it's not going to be every one. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, James? Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to add to your list there uh, two things. I look for anything else in the air. So, you know, the birds or uh, fluff or corn stalks or, you know, anything else. Uh, I, I use that as a clue as air going up or down. Uh, and then also watching the clouds and uh, things on the ground, I try to focus on things that I notice that change. So, you know, changes might be uh, ripples on the water. You know, I can't really tell exactly where there's ripples, but if like a pond or a lake has no ripples, and then a little bit later I see there's a lot of ripples, then maybe there's a uh, thermal or something going off there. Or obviously if I see a new cloud forming uh, or I avoid an old a cloud that's, you know, obviously falling apart, you know, so I'm always kind of this difference engine going on. I think that's really, really good advice. Uh, try to observe everything. And if you're near a ridge with trees with leaves, you can watch thermals track up the ridge, track up the, the hillside just by the <laughs> leaves moving in some places and not others. Ripples on water, like Tom said, it changes. There were ripples and now there aren't any. And then they are again, or they're going a different direction if it's a light wind day. Um, that might be something like this, where the thermal is sucking in air off over the water and making ripples. So look around a lot. That's really a... Uh, And all kinds of birds, like we think of raptors circling in thermals, and they do, of course. But um, uh, out west, you'll, you'll find swifts and things that are just darting around. And what are they doing? Well, they're eating the bugs that came up in a thermal. Yeah, Jamie. Oh, uh, sorry if this is a stupid question. I've, I'm, I'm really new to thermaling, and my only experience is 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 doing it with a motor so i've been motor thermaling lately um my question is you know flying along looking for lift you encounter some turbulence and not necessarily finding lift from that turbulence is that oftentimes a sign that you're hitting the edge of a thermal and that you should stop and kind of fly around a little bit looking for you know, the, the mass of the center of that the thermal, or is it just a random air bubble, or is it just no way to know? Well, that's a good question. It's, it's hard to, just from that, it's hard to have a clear answer. If there's no terrain around, you're not near a ridge, or and you're not close to the ground, um, where there might be turbulence from, from, for mechanical reasons, then, um, the, the turbulence that you run into might be from a thermal, but it could also be from a wind shear layer where the wind is blowing different directions. And at that interface, it can be quite turbulent, just usually that's a fairly thin layer. But um, uh, if, if, a, if, if the glider is just kind of moving a little, then often that means there's a thermal nearby. Um, and if you, if you, if you don't, uh, fly straight into it, it might be worth making a circle uh, and sniffing around. The, the, uh, the business of thermaling is really a different subject than we're 
that we're just talking about tonight mostly. Um, we can spend a whole couple of sessions on that and uh, easily and um, and I, and every uh, every good pilot we have will have a lot to say about it. So it's it's something to practice a lot. You you start to get a sense of when the glider moves, what does that mean? There's oh, that means it's over here. Um, until you until you experience that a, a while, it, it, and I think that's a lot of that's an experience thing. Um, but it can definitely be worth sniffing around if um, if you think you might have flown through something, especially if the vario beeped a little bit. Um, um, you could try making a circle if you're flying into wind, like if you've left the brace ridge and you're flying into wind. Then it's even a little different. If the vario beeps a little bit and then you get a little sink, usually you want to go straight because usually the better thermal is a little farther out front. Thank you. Okay. Let's... I don't think we're going to get through all of these, but that's okay. Let's see. I think I had another one here. Yeah, we have probably about 15 minutes or so. Okay. So, Here's a good one. So let's say that we've got our ground and we've got a landing field and we're coming merrily in on glide. And it's Western Massachusetts. So next to the field is five miles of trees. So we come tooling in here and we find a climb. Can we take it? Depends how much it's drifting over the trees. Exactly it's... right. It depends how much it's drifting. So the answer is maybe. If, if the climb is drifting like this, and we lose it, we don't have glide to get back to the field. So we can't take that one. But if it's a, if it's a heater that's doing that, we can climb, we can see if we got glide to the next field, which is off screen, and we can still make it back easily if, if we need to. So what you're paying attention to is whether you're climbing fast enough that you still have glide to the field. If the wind is stronger, then it needs a stronger thermal to give you that glide. If the wind is light, then the thermal can be pretty weak and you can still reliably make it back. But you want to make sure you can make it back. There's another one that's related. Uh, that we run into a lot in New England. So there's often a thermal gradient near the ground. Thermal, sorry, wind gradient near the ground. Um, so what's a wind gradient? It just means that the wind gets stronger as you get higher. And at some point, it maybe doesn't change much anymore for a while. But near the ground, there's always a wind gradient. And as you're coming in in your paraglider, um, let, let me. Do a little bit bigger scale, so. If I'm flying into wind and I and I descend into a gradient. What does my paraglider do? It's going to start covering more ground. <laughs> you have less wind. That's true. It'll start covering more ground. Um, what happens to my airspeed as I drop from one level into lighter wind? Nothing. Your airspeed shouldn't change. My airspeed doesn't change, except that for a moment, maybe it changes. So suddenly I move the glider to lighter wind. My glider says, oh, I need to Search. get my airspeed back. Sorry? 
Will it search then? It will search. That's exactly what it will do. So it will surge forward a bit to try to get back the error speed that it lost. And if the gradient continues, which it usually does, it'll continue to surge. And um, it tends to, to abate before the ground. So you don't need to worry about flying straight into the ground, but you can find yourself with literally a one-to-one -one glide over the ground because of the gradient. And so what that means is you don't want to set up and lose some altitude over the trees back here because you're thinking, okay, I've got glide to get to the field, but you drop into the gradient and you just drop into the trees. That's been done around here. Um, and I'd love to see all of you not do that. So um, I the one, the, clarification. Oh, sorry, finish your thought first because we're running it. The the one-to-one -one glide can be really alarming. And if you've got a telephone pole here, it's like, holy crap, am I gonna clear the wire? Because you thought you were fine. So the the cure is don't set up over or especially behind any obstacles while you're losing your altitude, stay a little bit in front. And then whatever happens to your glide, you'll be able to drop into the field. What, what, what were you gonna say, Shani? Why did you say that the glider thinks it has to make up airspeed? If it's got less headwind, isn't it going to accelerate? Well, if it, so whatever my airspeed is, as I'm sitting here, and let's, let's just say I'm a trim for, for convenience. If, if uh, suddenly the, I have less headwind, then I'm telling you the wrong thing, aren't I? It's uh, less headwind means that the glider is going to speed up. It's going to suddenly be going faster. Hmm. So I've had my explanation wrong on this. What is the correct explanation? I, I know the effect. The effect is real, and I've seen it many times. If um, you're flying it, if you're flying it, let's say 20, and the wind is blown at 10 at altitude, as you descend into slower airspeed, slower, slower winds, I should say, it still has to fly at 20. And the only way to do that is to sort of dive on its own and accelerate back to 20. So it's going to cause a few things. It's going to cause you to descend quicker because it regains its normal flight flying speed because we always fly at the same speed, basically. And um, your ground speed is going to accelerate. So ground speed will, will accelerate. Um, if it were having to accelerate back to 20, that would mean that the wind was looking like this. No, no, the wind always, you're always flying the same speed. The wind is the only thing that is changing. So if you're okay. flying at 20 and the wind's blowing at 10, your ground speed's 10. If it slows down to five right above the ground, your wind, your ground speed will now accelerate to 15. Does that make sense? So my, my ground speed, my ground speed will go up. That makes sense. Right. So what, What's making the glider surge? The glider is surging because it has to regain its natural flight speed. It always flies at 20, basically, whatever. Right, whatever but, the speed is. but it just got accelerated by this amount. Because yeah, the my wind, intuition, wind intuitively, I, it seems but to me that it would accelerate. The, momentum, the, the weight of, the, of your body and the wing is, is moving at a certain speed. When the wind decreases, it has to over, it has to get your body and the wing back up to its flying speed. And the only way it can do that is it dives a little bit. Just like in a regular small plane, you, if you fly in the low, like a slower wind near the ground, you'll start dropping like a rock until you get up to the right speed again. I, I think that there is a frame of reference problem here. If if we for, if we took the ground out of here, let's say we were doing this uh, at ten thousand feet, as as you descend into slower air, the 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 airspeed on the glider is going to be the same. There's actually no difference 
Uh, but if the if the change is fast enough, there will be a difference, and your wing will want to make up. Your wing will will naturally go back up to its flying speed by nosing down a little bit. But the yeah. the the place you're losing me down is. I don't think the, the wing is getting slowed down by the instantaneous change. I think it's getting more airspeed, not less, because there's less wind pushing against it. No, your, yeah. wing, the, your wing is always flying the same speed. But if it suddenly goes from 10 to 5, like in a gust, it will, <clears throat> your wing has to regain that flying speed because it always flies. It's just how it's configured. It flies at 20. Right, well, but if the wind if the wind goes from ten to five, and I'm flying into the wind, I didn't just lose five kilometers of airspeed. I just if it was quick enough, enough, if it was quick enough, your wing would lose its flying speed, and you'd dive to regain it. Yeah, it, it, if I can inject something here, the what what Don is talking about uh, happens only to the extent that there are inertial changes to the aircraft to the wing or the pilot you know us suspended under the under the wing and typically that has to happen fairly quickly but it, it can in other words if the gradient is quite severe uh then yeah the, correct. you know the the there is a difference there but typically coming into land uh the gradient is there and it but it's not that severe what we uh what affects us is this reference point that we see the ground speeding up and then we start reacting potentially improperly. We think that the wing is, is diving, but in fact, the wing is not diving. The ground is just now passing by faster because we are in the gradient. And so a lot of times it's the pilot that's causing the problem, not necessarily the gradient itself. Well, okay, I understand that. And I understand the whole um, bogus argument about uh, downwind turns causing crashes and and so on, which I'd, I'd like to not get into today. But in but in this case, there's no question that when you drop into a gradient, your glide degrades. As I've drawn, I've I've just done this so many times. So my explanation is wrong, but that's what's happening. So let's leave it as an extra credit problem for next time or next week but why is it that my glide would degrade from from whatever it was in that headwind to much worse when i drop into this gradient okay leslie how much time do we have any or are we done um you have probably about 10 minutes if you want okay let's um so there we talked about that can I add that gradient could also be a shift in direction of the wind, not just velocity? Yes. Uh, for the purposes of where you're setting up at the downwind edge of a field, I don't think that's usually a, a big deal, but it's always worth paying attention to direction too. And uh, in my experience, James, the reason you have a degraded glide is because the wind actually increases at some level. We're not talking about the last five feet. We're not talking about ground effect, but when you get into a cleaner airflow that's often a landing area, you might find that the wind picks up a little bit. Could be a little venturi happening. I don't know, but I think you're 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 getting into more headwind than you expected a lot of times when you're coming in for a landing and you end up coming up short. But I'm not sure if that explains it. Hmm. That doesn't feel like what I've experienced. Ground effect doesn't apply to paragliders much because their wings too far from the ground. Um, okay. Which of these questions is, is interesting? We already talked about this one. We already talked about this. That's margin. And uh -oh. Landing on a where to land on a field somewhere where you can get out is nice. Yeah, being able to get out, being in with uh, with multiple cows instead of one cow. Um, hey, 
Hey, how do you pull off a low save? Make sure you've got a, a landing secure that you can go and land in if you lose it and then focus, focus like crazy on the thermal and the climb. And it's, uh, thermals are often disorganized when they're low. So if it seems like you're not centering very well, don't blame yourself. It might be that the thermal is so small that you can only climb during one third of your circle. And then you might even be in a little bit of sync and then you're climbing a little in a third and then you shift your circle that way a little bit and you're still only climbing in a third of your circle. So it might just be that small when you're low. Um, stay focused, try to center as well as you can and see if you can climb out. But I start when I'm, when I'm low and I'm coming into a field and there's a thermal, I say out loud to myself, it's okay if I land here because that calms me down. Now, okay, I'm not like making this into something that it's not. I'm just trying to stay in the air, but I'm fine if I land here. So I actually like to say that out loud. I don't know if that will help you, but um, find something that will, that will help you so that you can be present and focused. I got a helpful question. I think James, if we have time, you're, you're uh, a, lot, a lot of times when you lose a thermal, you're flying out one side or the other, the upwind, the downwind side. Let's say you're going cross country and you lose your thermal. With that knowledge that we usually fall out one side or the other, uh, which direction would you head to get back into it? I guess we, your Vario can tell you these days, but uh, assuming you didn't have that feature on your Vario, uh, where do we usually fall out of the upwind, the downwind side of the thermal? and and which way do you recommend trying first to head back into it? Yeah, boy, that's a that's a great question. Um, and I don't have the best answer. Uh, I think I read or heard when I was uh, first learning to thermal that it's much worse to fall out of the downwind side, that uh, there might be sink on that side. So if I fall out over there, it's going to be worse. and so I, I, I still have this instinct to avoid the downwind side and I fall out the front side, the upwind side much more often now. And I think that's because I have this embedded instinct to try to avoid the downwind side. Um, the biggest thing that I think of, let's go to a top view for a minute, is you're going around in a circle in your, in your thermal. So you've got lift somewhere. And uh, so you want to be aware of, okay, the lift was over there. So I know I want to shift my circle this way. And so on my next time around, I come around and I get to here and I want to extend. Long gate, yeah. It's made me a curve there that I don't want, but... Um, so I want to extend this way, and then now I've moved my my uh, circle a little bit. And in in a lot of climbs, I'm making an adjustment like that every single circle. But you want to make it small. Um, uh, it's really easy to get smart, and you think, okay, I know the thermals like like way over here. Whoops and then make a big extension and then just find that you've lost it completely. So, and I still do this often, um, a few times a flight. And uh, even though I know better, the what works better is to make small adjustments. So if you straighten out and, and fly three seconds, two seconds on uh, this part here, just two or three seconds. And then you've shifted your, it, it's, I forget how many it is, three or four seconds, you've shifted your circle half a diameter. Uh, it doesn't take very long. And if it's not enough, then fine, do it again on the next circle, but make your extension small. In terms of how big a circle to make, uh, 
it, it depends a lot on, I mean, you, you can optimize that for the particular thermal as a tight core, you might have 12 seconds for a circle, uh, a, a big wide thermal, you might have 20 or 25 seconds for a circle. Uh, a good rule of thumb that Kelly Farina likes in his book, Mastering Paragliding, is 16 seconds. And people I've coached seem to find that that's pretty interesting. So see if you can make your circles take 16 seconds. So four seconds is 90 degrees, four seconds is 90 degrees, four seconds is 90 degrees. And if you're, if you don't get around in 16 seconds, then try turning a little bit more tightly, that will often be helpful. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for this whole thing. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Maybe just one more question if anybody has it, and then we probably have to end. Thanks for sharing, James. I'll ask, I'll ask one question here. So what do you know about the wind when you're, when you're flying XC and I'll answer it. Try to have the idea that you don't know about the wind. You know about what it was five miles away and a thousand feet higher, but it's probably different where you are right now. Don't assume that it's the same. Figure out what it is here because that affects everything. It affects which side of ridges, which side of hills is safe to go on, uh, which side of um, landing hills, um, which side of a hill to land on. Um, landing downwind of a low hill late in the day um, can just have terrible turbulence. So um, uh, always have the idea that you don't know what the wind is. Then I had a big one when we talked about that. Lee side flying. Let's, let's leave that for another day. There's a lot to talk about there. Was there a quick answer to how do you go XC without going XC? How do you practice? Oh, XC? yeah. Okay. That seems like a um, short one. Well, so you, you can learn to climb well. You can improve your thermaling technique. Get with other people. People who are experienced, you don't have to worry about having a collision. If you're climbing with Bianca, she'll stay away from you if you do something crazy there's just no risk climbing with bianca climbing with eduardo climbing with andre and any person with a lot of experience go and try to climb with them they'll they'll try to help you um and get used to circling with other people because other people are a great yardstick for if they're going out faster than you then they're centering better and um so that's a really good skill uh and that's one that you can practice and if other people are, are if a bunch of other people are getting into cloud base and you're not getting to cloud base well don't get down on yourself but you've got something to work on there and then when you get so you can get to cloud base most of the days when it's possible man that's fun like, cloud base is just a magical place to be you look out and all the clouds are lined up at your altitude and then you go on glide and get to the next cloud. That's it's worth learning how to thermal well just for that. Fields. Practice evaluating fields. Every field that you fly over and you're just flying around wh whichever site you like to fly at, look down at that field. At Ellenville, you've got the golf course. Okay, it's not great to land at a golf course, but it's okay to land at a golf course. You provide some entertainment for the golfers and often they'll they'll buy you a beer at the clubhouse um at least they don't usually come out with a gun um at ellenville there's a high school um at high school at i've landed there more than once at at high school athletic fields there is a fence around the baseball field um it might be a low fence but you don't want to crash into it while you're landing so to what Tom was saying earlier, you got to find the fence for the backdrop. You got to find the fence around the outfield. You got to find the wires. You got to find the light poles. There's all kinds of stuff. And so even if you're not going to land there, maybe you've just gotten high and you've flown a little bit north at Ellenville, 
look down and study that thing and see what see if you can find everything what and in this wind what would be the upwind obstacles that you want to not land close to because there will be turbulence downwind of them so evaluating fields is is a big thing you can do getting better at thermaling is a big thing you, you can do practicing with the wind what can you learn about the wind maybe make a page in your instrument that doesn't show your instrument's wind indicator and see what you can figure out from the other fields that we listed and then switch to that page and see if your instrument instrument agrees um and it, you might find that it's not right actually at least some of the time what so, what am i leaving out who, who else has something no, you can... nothing i think that um we're just about out of time and okay. um i just want to say thank you so much that was excellent you've given us so much to think about and so much to practice so really appreciate your time um, and your expertise and you. sharing it with us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you, thank James. You. You're very welcome. It's been a, it's been fun. I'm sorry we went so long. Hopefully, it, hopefully it's been useful. Definitely. Yes. All right. I will hope to see all of you on one or another of our hills sometime all soon right. with nice conditions. Good night. Good night. Good night.